Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Today on April 7th, 2023, wow, it's April already, Uh, I'm excited to welcome Stephanie Slade onto the podcast to talk about fusionism, which maybe you guessed it, is the fusion of two things. We're going to get into that shortly. She's a senior editor at Reason, the magazine of free minds and free markets, and she's a fellow in liberal studies at the Acton Institute. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Juliet. So before we get started... What is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? I want to give you something in the sort of um, career advice zone. And that is, I think that you should, uh, people your age should be willing to talk very openly about their goals. Uh, I think when you're first starting out, you don't necessarily know or you're not sure quite how open you should be about where you're trying to get in life. Um, But I have found in my experience that people really want to be helpful. They want to help you get where you're going. Uh, they're willing to really, go, you know, many people are willing to go out on a limb for you, but they need to know what your goals are and what your interests are and where you're trying to get. And so I got my first job as a speechwriter because I told all my professors in college that I was really interested in political speechwriting. And one of them heard about a member of Congress who needed some speeches written and recommended me and I got hired. Um, and then later I got my first op-eds published because I, I was working in political consulting and I told my boss that I was very interested in journalism and publishing. Um, And that was a little bit of maybe a a risk that I was taking, um, doing one kind of work and telling my boss that I was interested in a different kind of work. Um, But what happened is that she was approached by an editor at US News and World Report who was looking for somebody to write some op-eds and wanted her to write them. And instead she sent him to me and um, I got my first op-eds published that way. So talk openly about your goals and where you're trying to go um, because people want to help you, um, but they won't be able to unless they know, you know, it, what you want is for your name to be the first one that pops into their head when they hear about a great opportunity. And it, it's it's not the case that what you know doesn't matter. You know, there's that old saying, it doesn't matter what you know, it matters who you know. That's not quite right. Um, what you matter does know, but who you matter knows as well. So you want lots of people to be um, having your mind, your face and their, your name at the top of their mind when they hear about opportunities that might be of interest to you. That's a very solid and actionable piece of advice. I feel like a lot of people my age or a lot of like the job search process, which starts for some sectors, even when you're a second year in college. Crazy, in my (laughs) opinion. But I don't know, you do you, I guess. Um, But it's funny, because there are so many rules, like the institution is set of like, you follow this channel, this channel, this channel. But then you talk to a lot of people who have had jobs and like lived life a little bit longer. And life never really follows a strict path. And so I I think actually advocating for yourself, regardless of where you are in a given moment, will help you get where you want to go. I don't, I just, a good piece of advice that seems pretty straightforward, but the, the academic world of undergrads don't seem to understand that. And I don't really understand that either. So thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. So fusionism. It was developed at National Review in the 1950s under the editor editorship, wow, that word is a little difficult, of um, Bill Buckley, William F. Buckley Jr., and is most identified with his associate editor, Frank Meyer. So if I were to ask Frank Meyer to define fusionism, how would he describe it? Great question. Yeah, because I think today, most people probably haven't heard the word at all in a political context. And if they have, they think, oh, fusionism, that was the alliance that formed between libertarians and sort of uh, social conservatives or religious conservatives during the Cold War era. Because, you know, if you're um, a libertarian, you dislike the Soviet Union because it's militantly anti-capitalist. 
And if you are a social conservative or a religious conservative, then you dislike the Soviet Union because it's militantly atheistic. And so the two groups came together and they fused into this coalition. That's, I think, what most people who have heard the term would say. Um, Frank Meyer would disagree. Frank Meyer, who is sort of was sort of the godfather of this idea, he is the person who articulated the philosophy that came to be known as fusionism, um, had a totally different understanding, which is not that it was a coalition of two different groups, but rather that it was a philosophy that said that both liberty and virtue are the pillars on which Western civilization rests. That they're both important. They're both cr- critical, non-negotiable. That we um, ought to be uh, committed to conserving and preserving both liberty and virtue, um, and and that that's what it really it really means. He he would have said to be a, a conservative in the American context. So it's not. It's quite different from what it would mean to be a conservative in say the nineteenth century European context. But here in America, a, a conservative is somebody who wants to conserve the American founding, which is classically liberal, which you know, which pr- prioritizes individual liberty, um, but that also recognizes the importance of tradition and order and virtue um, in life. Can you give us a short history of fusionism in light of it not just being a marriage of convenience? Yeah, the the there was a debate going on sort of in, in the the post-World War II era in America about what is America? What does the country stand for? What does it mean to be a conservative in this context? And there were people who were more libertarians, more focused on, you know, laissez-faire, free market economic policy and that sort of thing. And there were people who were more religious traditionalists who were saying, no, we need to be promoting a virtuous society. It's not just about liberty. Um, There's more to life than that than being free. Um, Frank Meyer was one of the founding editors of National Review magazine. As you mentioned, the magazine was founded in 1955. And Buckley, who was the the founder, he brought in a whole bunch of people, smart people who were on all sides of this debate. So he he went out and he got Russell Kirk to agree to write a column and he got Hayek and Milton Friedman to agree to contribute. And one of the people he, he brought in was this guy named Frank Meyer. And Frank Meyer wrote a column for the magazine in which he articulated this idea of, hey, it's not about choosing one or the other, liberty or virtue. It's not about being a libertarian or a traditionalist. It's about recognizing that these two things need each other and they're mutually reinforcing. And if you only defend one or the other of them, then you're probably going to end up having your society sort of collapse because neither one is enough, right? They're both non-negotiable, necessary pillars. Um, So he was writing these, 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 these ideas in National Review. And most people would say, I mean, it wasn't that he was, everybody immediately fell in line behind him. There were lots of debates happening in the pages of National Review Magazine and at conferences. You would go to the Philadelphia Society Conference and people would debate back and forth. Is Frank Meyer right? Is Frank Meyer wrong? Is fusionism a coherent philosophy or not? Um, but overall, it was it became a very influential idea. It clearly won over Buckley himself and became a sort of animating ethos that, that was a really important part of the national, you know, what National Review stood for, um, and a lot of the conservative movement, the uh, American institutions, the the Heritage Foundation and um, ISI and TFAS and all these organizations that were founded in the 20th century to advance conservative causes, they were all built upon this this idea. They, I mean, lo- almost all of them sort of um, bought into this idea of yes, liberty and virtue are the two pillars we we are going to try to to defend and promote both of them. So the whole conservative movement was built on this this sort of idea of fusionism as the fusion of liberty and virtue. Does your definition of fusionism differ at all from Myers? Um, I think my understanding of it, I mean, I think the understanding, so a thing you should know is that Frank Meyer died in in 1972. So he he was this important figure for about, you know, 15 or 20 years and then he he sort of had this untimely death. And so other people had to take up the, you know, pick up the banner and and take these ideas and be defending and articulating and developing them. So I think the ideas have developed a little bit over time. I wouldn't necessarily agree with 100% of what Frank Meyer believed, um, but I think he set a really solid foundation for for what the way we should think about, you know, what is a good society? It's a society in which we are both free and virtuous. Ideally, that's what a good society is. And and he also, um, I think he said that, or a thing that sort of comes out implicitly in his writing that I really love and that I think has been lost a little bit in, um, in sort of mo- modern politics of the right of center is he said, okay, we have these two things, liberty and virtue. 
Um, how do you have two number one priorities? Well, he would say liberty is the highest political value. It is the thing that government exists to do, to protect, is our individual liberty. Um, but in the non-governmental sphere, and he drew this sharp distinction between the governmental sphere and the non-governmental sphere, when you step outside of questions of public policy and, and the use of, of coercive government power, and you think about all the many, many, many things that we do uh, and decisions we have to make in our in our personal lives, in our private lives, and in, in civil society, um, there liberty is not the highest virtue, um, the highest value. In fact, virtue, living a virtuous life, seeking to be um, good people and to build a good society and to cultivate a good, healthy culture, virtuous culture. These are the highest things that we should be, that we should be going for. Um, but that, so his point was you use coercion, to, uh, the coercive power of the state exists to protect individual liberty. Um, but that the once we have that liberty, we have to decide what do we do with it? And, and in that non-governmental sphere, we ought to be pursuing virtuous lives. That's, that's the point of having, that's the whole point of having freedom. So I, I don't know, like it's so different from even among libertarians, the way that the general libertarian might go about defending liberty or talking about liberty. Many might cry contradiction. That's impossible. Um, and I guess, although there are different their priorities in different spheres of life, there's no way they don't interact. So how do the two priorities work together slash interact with each other? I think the, the the insight here is that they really do need each other. That if you have, for example, um, a society that's not virtuous, a people who are constantly lying, cheating and stealing and trying to assault each other and steal from each other, um, where they don't believe in honesty and integrity and in having moral obligations to one another. If you have a society that's not virtuous, where the people do not are not sort of steeped in the ideas of classically understood what it means to be a good person, right, right and wrong morality, um, it's going to be very hard to sustain a limited government in that society because people are constantly trying to take advantage of each other and to hurt each other, and so. Other people, in order to defend themselves from the stronger people in society, are going to demand a government that comes in and protects them. So we have to have government that regulates bi uh, businesses and companies because we don't trust business people to be, you know, to, to play by the rules. And we, if we have a lot of violent crime, we're going to want a larger police state, right? So you can't really sustain limited government, um, which is one of the one of the you know things that that libertarians and conservatives historically overlapped on. We, we want a limited, we want a limited government. Um, if we want any government at all, we want it to stick to the things like protecting, um, life, liberty, and property. Um, but you can't really have a government that's, that stays limited, um, or you're unlikely to be able to maintain, to sustain that government. If you don't have people who believe themselves to have moral obligations to each other, that they, that they willingly take on and that they, and that they don't have to be coerced in every way to play nicely with each other in life. Um, but we do it because we believe that we that that's the world we want to live in. So having a virtuous society makes having a, a, a limited government and a free society e easier, more more likely to to be sustainable. And then conversely, I think the idea is that if you have um, if you have a, a limited government and free markets and that sort of thing, then that that promotes that produces the conditions that allow us to pursue virtue more easily. So. Anytime you have uh, material abundance in your society, the kind of thing that we see in free market societies as opposed to, you know, top-down command and control societies, um, it makes it easier to, to pursue higher things in life, excellence in your private life, when you're not just scraping by trying to survive and wondering how you're going to, uh, you know, feed your children. You can pursue the higher things in life. So it opens up this opportunity for us to be better versions of ourselves if we live in a, in a materially abundant society and material abundance, as we know, is a function of free markets. Um, likewise, if we are trying to be good people to pursue virtue in our, in our private lives, um, we need to have the right to make choices for ourselves. You can't really be virtuous if every choice you make is micromanaged at the point of a gun. And, you know, we live in a sort of hyper surveillance state where all of our choices are monitored by the government. And anytime we step out of line, we're punished for it. You're not going to learn to be virtuous 
people that way. That's that that's not going to be conducive to us because I think of virtue as like it's a muscle. You have to you have to work it. You have to be able to make bad choices in order to learn to make good choices. So freedom is a condition for virtue, and virtue is a condition for freedom. These are this is the way that these two things uh, under the sort of fusionist philosophy we would say these two things. You can see that they they actually work together to lead to a better society and a better um, the conditions that lead to better lives. I want to kind of take a step back for a moment and take the advice from your first question and ask explicitly, like, what these goals are. Like, what? So you say virtue, but what does virtue mean? What are these higher things that we should strive to with our freedom? So the thing about fusionism is that it really, and, and, Frank Meyer was an interesting character because he was not super religious himself, although he converted to Catholicism at the end of his life. Um, But he believed that we are the inheritors of the Judeo-Christian sort of Western tradition. And so when he talked about virtue, he didn't just mean, I mean, it wasn't, this wasn't arbitrary for him. He said, we've inherited a tradition that, that, you know, over centuries, human beings have through trial and error figured out what works and what doesn't work. And we, we have learned through, um, through 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 these religious sources, what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, what is the what is the natural law or the moral law look like? What are the types of behaviors and choices that that again lead to a good life that make us happy and make us good people? And what are the things that lead lead us astray? And so he had this very traditional Judeo-Christian understanding of what virtue means. So if you read your Bible, if you study the Judeo-Christian tradition, You'll you'll see these 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 lessons and these um, this guidance about what it means to live a good life, and he would say that's what we're talking about. That's kind of we ought to be respectful of of the wisdom of the inherited tradition. So um, respect for our, our elders and um, just the idea that we have moral obligations to each other. Um, and just because something was done freely doesn't mean it, it, that it was a good choice. Um, this is virtue. This is uh, the pursuit of excellence to try to be the best human beings that we can be as opposed to um, just always doing what feels good in the moment. It's it's funny because the absence of that is a lot of what I think I see and what I, I think a lot of people acknowledge that this is kind of what the, the Catholic post-liberal integralist, whatever you want to call them, um, what this group is kind of responding to is the lack of that. Um, and for some reason, realizing that is like the missing piece in the puzzle, it like kind of like clicks and makes sense. Um, and I mean, I guess on that note, what about this current moment kind of jump started this renewed interest or, uh, striving towards fusionism? Yeah, well, so it's interesting. I'm trying to revive fusionism, and I do think there's interest in in that. But um, part of part of why I think it's necessary that project is necessary is that it was lost a little bit. You know, it was this very influential idea in the middle of the 20th century, and like I said earlier, sort of all the institutions of the American conservative movement were built upon this idea. It was taken as a given. It was sort of a consensus. Um, but at some point, you know, after the Cold War ended, and I don't know, over time. Um, people stop talking about fusionism, uh, you know, you know, among, among conservatives, you, you don't hear that word very much anymore. Um, and I think it was a sort of lost idea. And that's why I feel like it needs to be brought back because, um, because we, we, we lost sight of it. We, nobody, nobody learns about this anymore. Um, I think what we have seen, and this is where the, the what I call the new right, the post-liberal right, the, the Catholic integralists, the, what I call will to power conservatives, um, what they're reacting to is, and they're not entirely wrong about this, the many ways in which virtue has diminished in our modern society, in which we have become more libertine, more hedonistic, more relativistic, morally relativistic in this society, where um, these traditional values and, uh, and understanding of virtue have kind of become out of fashion. Um, and the many ways in which that, 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 that fact, that, that, um, change has led to all kinds of social dysfunctions. I mean, they're looking around and they're seeing all kinds of things. They're seeing marriage rates um, down and divorce rates up and people aren't having kids anymore. And there's suicide and drug overdoses, right? And um, 
pornography addiction and all they're looking around and they're saying this is not the world that we want to live in and they and they look at libertarians and they say this is not what you promised would happen if we uh, went along with your um sort of uh, a, a political agenda of individual liberty and so we tried your libertarianism we tried your classical liberalism we tried your individual liberty and your limited government and it brought us to this dystopian they would say dystopian uh, place where there's no virtue you know and people who believe in traditional traditional religious values are um, socially ostracized and sometimes maybe even at uh, risk of losing their jobs if they say the wrong thing about gay marriage or trans issues or something. Um, we tried your libertarianism. We don't like where it got us. It's time for us to embrace, this is what they would say, muscular gover government. We need to be willing to use the power, wield the power of the state to destroy our enemies and to re reorient society to the common good, to these what we understand to be true virtue. So I would say they're not entirely wrong about their diagnosis of the problem, but they're very wrong and, and terrifyingly wrong in what they want to do about it. So their prescription to abandon classical liberalism or individual liberty um, and to wield state power to try to destroy their enemies and force the country to be virtuous again is so misguided, right? For both pragmatic reasons and moral reasons. Both it's it's running the risk of, I mean, it, it quite literally says we don't care what the people want. We are going to impose our conception of right and wrong on them. I think that is morally problematic. Um, but it's also just like from a practical matter, it's like what makes you think that you are going to be able to be the ones in power, willing this power? Um, you know, what? where, where do you, how, how do you imagine that you're going to be able to, are you going to forcibly shut down businesses on Sundays because you think that everybody should be in church instead? Are you going to be going to people's houses and putting a gun to their head and making them go to church? Like, what exactly do you think that the the route to this um to the to this outcome that you want is? Um, they tend to be very cagey about what exactly they would do with their power. They just say we need to be willing to wield power. They don't want to tell you exactly how they would wield it. And that's because it gets really scary once you start trying to nail down the specifics. So I would say I agree with them in some in some ways, in many ways, about some of the ways in which our society has lost sight of the importance of virtue. But I think that we absolutely, there's just no shortcut or yeah, there's, there's no way around the fact that we have to rebuild the culture and change hearts and minds and use persuasion um, and, and civil society to try to, to, to solve this problem. Um, that if you turn to the coercive power of the state, it's going to end badly, not just, um, I mean, it's not just that you're, that you're going to be, uh, you know, violating people's freedom, but it's probably going to end badly for you because you're probably not going to always be the ones using that in, in power, the ones wielding that power. Maybe it's just me being the type of person where if I was the one who wielded the gun, as we often uh, diminish government into being as uh, free marketers, uh, I would use the gun to make it so other people couldn't use the gun. <laughs> you know, I would like use the gun against itself and so maybe this comes from that, but it seems a little silly, this notion, not uh, silly, silly kind of makes it seem less, less valid than it might be. But it seems a little naive that people believe that, oh, if only I had the gun, if only I had the gun, then I wouldn't have to worry about who uses the gun after I use the gun, because when I have the gun, it'll work. But like the gun always <laughs> changes hands, you know? <laughs> this is this is the insight that Lord Acton, you know, famously gave us that power has a tendency to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, we all, everybody wants to think that, well, they would use the power, they would wield the power responsibly. Um, it wouldn't corrupt me, but it basically always does. So I guess we've we've kind of covered that the diagnosis might be right. The the reaction to things that are being observed in modern society is not necessarily unfounded. Um, but do you have a theory as to why virtue in society has diminished? Well, I think actually both of the fusionist pillars have been faltering a little bit over time. So it's not just that we are not focused on... Um, virtue, that virtue is sort of out of fashion in the modern era. Um, it's also that, you know, the other pillar of fusionism is that the whole purpose of government is to protect individual liberty and um, when, and not to venture beyond that, 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 that legitimate purpose. Um, but our government does, you know, in so many ways, um, venture beyond it's what we would consider to be the, the, the minimal um, 
the, the purpose, the legitimate purpose of government to protect people's freedom and their basic rights so that they can then pursue good lives. Our government does so much more than that. It, in, it interferes in the economy in so many ways. It tries to make us virtuous in so many ways. And in, in many cases, it's not using the traditional Judeo-Christian understanding of virtue, but rather a sort of um, woke left leftist um, conception of virtue that's sort of reigning in the zeitgeist today. Um, it just does so much more. So we don't, we have neither the, the limited government um, pillar of fusionism that says that government, the highest political value is, is virtue, is um, liberty, excuse me, nor do we have this sense that the whole purpose of freedom is for us to then pursue virtue and in, in, uh, rightly understood in our personal lives. So we're not doing either one. And in some cases, I think, you know, we talked at the beginning about how these things, there's an interaction between them. When government doesn't just stay limited to the things that it should be doing, protecting our, our basic rights, um, when it instead tries to solve all of our problems for us coercively, it can actually undermine the ability for people to be virtuous. So one of the one of the very famous um, concepts that I think is relevant here is the idea of crowding out of civil society. I think that we, as individuals and as members of communities, have an obligation to look out for those in our community who can't look out for themselves. And when somebody falls on hard times or when somebody is um, disabled or um, elderly and can't provide for themselves, um, we probably have a, a duty out of charity to help them in some way. But I think that that should be done through voluntary and private and non-coercive means. When government instead says, well, I'll just create a bureaucracy that's going to solve that problem. I'll just launch a new government program that, we, well, that will coercively take your tax dollars away from you and run them through a bureaucracy and then spit them out and, and use them to try to solve this problem of helping people in need it ends up crowding out the ability of us to think creatively about how we might have solved that problem sort of on the street level, face to face with the person in our community who needs us. It makes us feel like we're no longer on the front lines. It's no longer our obligation to help those in need around us because, well, I don't know, the government, it's the government's job to do that. I'm already paying my taxes, right? Like if something could be done to solve this problem, surely the smart people in Washington would be doing it already. So it's not up to me to do this. So it makes us actually feel less of an obligation to our neighbors. Um, it makes us less um, be, be sort of less creative in terms of thinking about how we could try to band together with our uh, neighbors to solve problems. It makes us less virtuous, right, over time. And it fosters dependency on the part of those that it's supposedly helping. And it often makes their problem source on that end as well. So the virtue, the virtue, um, part of it, I think is cultural for sure. Again, virtue in the traditional sense is, has fallen out of fashion. It's out of style, style right now, you know, in the post sexual revolution era, for example. Um, but that, I think we can work with that. We can, we can use again, social pressure and persuasion and storytelling and community building and institution building to try to change a culture that has gone astray. Um, that's the way that that problem should be tackled. Um, but it, it's very hard when you have the government that's crowding out all of your ability, you know, the ability and the um, awareness that people have that they're supposed to be trying to solve these problems because it's doing, it's taking your money through taxes and it's doing all the things that it shouldn't be doing um, in the first place. And in some cases, it's even, this is um, a thing that I spent a lot of time writing about earlier in my career. In, some, in many cases, the government is actually actively attacking the private alternatives to government programs. So it's going after Catholic hospitals and Catholic adoption agencies, for example, because they're trying to live out their uh, understanding of right and wrong uh, and saying, you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna um, shut you down because you don't want to, you know, you're not willing to sort of yield to the the left wing or the uh, ascendant modern sense of what virtue is. Um, we're gonna we're gonna actually forcibly prevent you from operating using the power of the state to force you forcibly force you out of the marketplace. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens that that happens all the time. And um, when you, when you allow government to metastasize beyond its, its minimal legitimate functions. Well, it's funny to me because regardless of what you think about how much taxes we should be paying, what programs we should support, if you look at strictly, you're paying taxes to support who knows what, like you don't really know where your money is going. You're paying it to a faceless bureaucrat that you don't know. And then down the line, a faceless somebody that might be in your community might not be that you don't know versus 
the civil society channel where you know the person's face and you actually are invested in their lives in a way, it seems kind of evident in human nature that we would be more compelled and more, I, I don't know the right word necessarily. It would mean more to us and to them when it's face to face in a way. Um, so I don't know, shout out to civil society and uh, shout out to my interview with Rachel Ferguson on classical liberalism and civil society. If you guys want to check that out. <laughs> Definitely check that out. She's wonderful. And you know, I think I would add too is, Part of the sort of progressive, capital P progressive argument for replacing civil society with bureaucracy, with go with government programs, is this idea that, well, you know, we, we believe in um, economies of scale, right? They can do it more efficiently if it's done all in one place, um, instead of there being a patchwork of small community level, um, you know, different types of programs and institutions and charitable efforts to solve a problem. But I think one of the things that um, there was this story during the COVID years that was really striking to me, um, which was when you, when you have one government agency that's supposed to be solving a problem and all that whole patchwork of civil society institutions sort of dries up as a result, then you have one point of failure. And so if, for example, the social security office in your community shuts down for two and a half years because of a pandemic, everyone who would have otherwise, um, been relying upon the services that are available through that social security office will be, uh, will be screwed, right? You're, you're, you're going to all suffer as a result of that. You actually have a much more robust, um, ability to respond to crises when you have that patchwork of lots of different small scale, um, approaches to trying to solve a problem where when one fails, another one can step up, right? This is much more in keeping with the idea of a marketplace, um, than the idea of, uh, we need one big, um, efficient, cold, efficient, you know, far away bureaucracy that will solve the problem for us. It's also a little ignorant of public choice, which I guess like whose, whose fault is that not many people know or learn about public choice, especially, I mean, UVA is one of the three or four universities, I think that has public choice at the undergrad level, which is fascinating to me because it's like my favorite thing ever. But, um, and like, so it's, I think it's ignorant of public choice and of Hayek's idea of price as like a, a conveyor of knowledge, because we, we all kind of know like government isn't very aware of like whatever. They're, they're not in tune with prices because they can't be. But then you also have nonprofits and you see this in the nonprofit world. But the closer you get to the people, the more localized the, the organization, the charity, whatever it is, um, the better the results in a way, because the the better you can know what to do and what that society actually needs. So it kind of fights against this, I, I don't know, this blockage, this severance from the beauty and functionality of prices, right? Um, which I guess is why you, having competition is good in that sense. And believe it or not, this uh, there's a concept that comes directly out of Catholic social teaching um, that speaks directly to this. It's subsidiarity is this idea that we should not take away, um, we should not take away the ability of a lower level of society to solve a problem. This, you know, this, the level of society, society that's closer to the people who are suffering should be the first ones to try to solve that problem, as opposed to preempting them and moving it up to the higher levels of moving from a local community to the state government or from the state government to the federal government. You move, you become, you become, you know, you become estranged from the actual problem on the ground. This comes directly out of Catholic social teaching, which, which many people tend to intuitively think is of as lefty, left wing economically. Um, so I like to point out that there's lots of stuff in Catholic social teaching that is um, beautifully compatible with a sort of fusionistic, fusionist, you know, limited government uh, idea of what is the proper role of the state. You hear that, integralists? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, <laughs> so... I guess like what what are you doing and what is your entire project to revive fusionism? What have you been up to? <laughs> um most I mean I'm a journalist, so mostly I've been writing about the what I consider to be the turn away from fusionism within the conservative movement, so the rise of this new right, the will to power conservatives that I that I mentioned earlier, which includes the Catholic integralists, although they're actually a pretty small number of them. <laughs> I think there's a lot more in the national conservatism movement. 
Um, there's the neo-reactionary movement. There's the alt-right. I mean, one of the things that all these different groups um, have in common is that they kind of reject that idea that liberty is the highest political value and that the, per- you know, that we want to have a limited government that that protects basic rights and liberties so that people can then use their freedom to pursue higher things. They These new right all rejects that. They want, again, they want to seize control of government. They want conservatives to get comfortable embracing a quote unquote muscular state. They think, say things like um, we should be willing to use public power, political power to reward our friends and punish our enemies. Um, So it's a rejection of this idea of limited government, of um, decentralized government, of uh, government that just is there to protect our freedom where all the rest of this stuff should be in the not, you know, should be situated in the non-governmental sphere. Um, And so I've been covering these ideas, um, this this new right movement, the different factions and the interactions between them. Um, And but now I'm trying to uh, move toward not just pointing at what I think has gone wrong in our politics, but reminding people that there is this this older um sort of tried and true alternative understanding of of how conservatives um people on the right of center ought to approach politics which is you know grows out of fusionism and so i'm right now um in the early stages of working on a book about fusionism to try to make the case for to tell the history of this idea um kind of where we started and um to make the case for why you know it's wrong to think of fusionism as a thing that was suited to the 20th century and the Cold War era, but is not um, appropriate today. I think it is actually a, a timeless idea that we we need to recover. What I thought was super interesting that you mentioned earlier and that kind of recurs in a few of your pieces is that is the idea that conservatism in America is the conservation of classical liberal values, the values of the founding. Um, and that, I don't know, like, it, it's almost... I guess, like, how do we use that to our advantage? Not that the, this is a war. I, I don't like the the whole, it's a culture war. It's a political war. Like, we are all okay. At the end of the day, we still live in America. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be fine. But maybe I'm just an optimist. But I guess, like, everyone always tells me learning history and knowing history is the most important thing. <laughs> how do we use history and the fact that we understand and know this history to better defend fusionism and these sorts of ideals. One of the challenges we face, I think, in this country is that the word liberal has, uh, you know, it has just historically come to take on a meaning essentially opposite of what it started out meaning. So liberty, liberal, um, one time at one time and um, in other parts of the world still to this day, invokes the idea of prioritizing individual liberty. Um, limited government, rule of law, free markets, that sort of thing. But in this country, of course, we have the word liberal is associated in most regular people's minds with left of center, the Democratic Party, um, progressive policy. And that's actually an inversion of, uh, in many ways, of what it originally started out meaning. So they think we want, they want, they they like centralization of power, bureaucratization. They want to redistribute wealth. Um, the, The idea of what it means to be liberal in America has taken on this thing that's the opposite of what it once meant. So that's a challenge for us because when, when I say, um, you know, America was founded on liberal ideals, what I mean is we were we were um, declaring our right to be free from arbitrary government power, right, and to be self governing and to and for individuals to um, have the right to solve problems themselves individually and in community with each other, but non coercively. Um, and that's not what the word means for most people. So this, this is a challenge. It's a rhetorical challenge. When, um, pointing back to the importance of liberty at the founding and saying, therefore, what it means to be a conservative who wants to conserve the American founding, um, is in a sense to be a liberal. But what we mean by that is it is to prioritize, to cherish, uh, individual liberty. Uh, that telling that story, reminding people of that is important. The other side of it though, that the, the fusionist in me, um, feels compelled to mention is that what we don't want to do is be caricaturists where we say America is a liberal was, you know, had a liberal founding. We're a liberal country. Therefore conservatives shall be liberals. Um, end of story. Well, that overlooks the, the sort of deeply rooted importance of virtue and religion and tradition that goes back to the American founding as well. Um, so you, you maybe are familiar with the famous, um, quote by John Adams, where he said, you know, our constitution was made for a moral and religious people, and it is totally inadequate to the governance of any other kind of person. 
um, the the religi- religiosity and idea of traditional values and traditional morality and virtue in in that Judeo Christian sense was also a really important part of our history. And I think if we if we I think we have tended both among libertarians and I, I count myself as a libertarian um, and on the left for sure to ign- want to ignore that piece of the history as well, which then just emboldens the illiberal right, the the new right. Um, to say, well, you're falsifying history, um, so I don't have to take your arguments seriously. Yeah, it, it's almost like you, like you take the Tocqueville observations out of out of the equation when you look at history, because to me, Tocqueville kind of just documented what American so- civil society looked like. Like, obviously, he talked about government a bit, but. He he commented extensively on the free associations, and that is kind of what made America. As much as we talk about the ideals of the founding, they're dependent on this free association, which is, I guess, very fusionist. Um, and it's just kind of interesting like, to look at something without an essential piece of context is kind of to make it devoid of any actual meaning because it's just not real, right? <laughs> I don't know. That's right. It's a little word vomity of me, but, uh, you know. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on my podcast. I wish that we had more time, um, but you have given us a whole lot. And uh, I wish you the best in your journey, in your project to revive fusionism. I hope this podcast helps. Um, I have one last question for you. What is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? So my position on abortion has evolved. Um, I am maybe most well known um, for a piece I wrote back in 2015 called Why I Am a Pro-Life Libertarian. And I'm still a pro-life libertarian. I still believe that abortion is a tragedy. Um, And I would even say that I still think that in an ideal world, abortion would be illegal. And I look forward sort of with hope to a future in which I would live in a world where abortion is is not... um, uh, endorsed by the law. Um, however, a thing that that sort of being steeped in libertarian ideas has shown me over the years is how important it is for culture, cultural change to come first. Um, if you try to impose a change at the legal at the, in the legal regime on a culture, on a, on a population that doesn't accept the underlying moral foundations of that law, um, then you end up with all the same dysfunctions and and horrors associated with every other kind of prohibition, alcohol pro- prohibition, you know, in the 1920s, the drug war today. When you try to outlaw a thing that there's still a lot of demand for at the cultural level, you just, you produce and enable and empower black markets, organized crime, you know, a lot more death and destruction. So I don't think that the right way to go about, you know, I say this again, as somebody who believes that life begins at conception and that abortion is a tragedy, but I think that we ought, we, that those of us who are sort of start with those um, beliefs like me ought to be much more focused on cultural change, on changing public opinion, on reaching people, you know, at the hearts and minds level, um, as opposed to imposing law on society from the top down. Um, I do think that actually the, the, the recent Supreme Court Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade and returning um, the locus of control for abortion law to the state level is probably a step in the right direction, because it means that in any given state, the law is going to be able to be more closely aligned with where the center of gravity in terms of public opinion and culture is in that state. Um, and so we're going to have fewer um, of those terrible un- unintended consequences that come from prohibition under this current regime. Um, so I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not necessarily, um, you know, I haven't, I certainly have not changed my view on abortion itself, but I think that I have a more, I have, I'm more skeptical than I once was of the idea that we can use the law um, without first having changed the culture. Once again, I'd like to thank my guests for their time and insight, and I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you.